All righty. So, this title for uh, this sermon is Jesus, the King of Truth. And I invite you all to join me in an attitude of prayer, if you will. God, creator of us all, rescuer of us from when we have fallen into our darkest of places, we ask that you be with us now. God, we pray that you send your Holy Spirit into this place, set us on fire for you, so that we can know your heart, that we can feel your worries, your concerns, and know just how to go out and serve the world. We pray for your wisdom, your discernment. We pray this morning that you lead us to be better servants, better disciples, better members of the kingdom of God. And God, I also pray for myself this morning that the words that I speak this morning not be my own, but may they be yours, O God. You are the one we have come to worship. You are the one we've come to praise. And all wisdom comes from you. So use me as you see fit. Let your message be carried into our hearts this day. So that we can go out into the world and love your creation as you have called us to do. Following the example that Jesus set for us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So let's take a moment to revisit a childhood classic, How the Grinch Stole Christmas. Now you may be thinking, how in the world does this tie in? We haven't even hit baby Jesus scriptures yet. Well, stay with me for a little bit. Those of you for whom the story is a little bit less familiar, the gist is that there's this Grinch who lives with his dog, Max, apart from the entire town of Whoville. And as his name implies, he's kind of grumpy. One day he decides that he's had it with the Who's joyful Christmas festivities and noise. He decides that he'll steal everything Christmas from Whoville after everyone has gone to sleep on Christmas Eve. He figures everyone will wake up on Christmas morning with not a bit of Christmas in sight. And just like that, it will have been canceled, and it will have to be canceled. The reaction of the Who's, of course, was unlike what the Grinch expected. As dawn arrives, the Grinch expects the people in Whoville to let out a bitter and sorrowful cry, but is confused to hear them singing a joyous Christmas song instead. He puzzles for a moment until it dawns on him that maybe Christmas perhaps means a little bit more than just presents and feasting. In the same way, Jesus' life as a king with a kingdom wasn't what the world expected either. We hear how Jesus' kingship doesn't match what the world expects in the very first verse of this morning's scripture. Having heard the demand of the Jewish leaders, Pilate goes into his headquarters and speaks with Jesus for the first time. He does not ask Jesus if he is the Messiah, but rather if he is the king of the Jews. This is a political rather than a religious charge, and Pilate would not care if Jesus was the anointed one of God, because as he asks ironically, I I am not a Jew, am I? But he would care, of course, if it was a new political ruler that was arising that might challenge the Roman rule. And Jesus asks Pilate when he was prompted this question, was it Pilate's own curiosity or charges brought by the Jewish leaders that led him to that question? Scripture has been telling us from the beginning of the gospel that Jesus is in fact the king of Israel. The gospel then goes on to explain that Jesus is not a king that the world would ever recognize. This is a king who speaks to the lowly and the rejected. This is the king who serves rather than being served. This is the king who enters the holy city not triumphantly on a horse, but seated on a donkey. 
He is the king unlike any other king, and his kingdom is unlike any other, for it is not of this world. Pilate asks Jesus what has been done, why the authorities handed him over to be killed in the first place. What terrible thing has he done? And Jesus then, in an unrelated note, goes back to answering that first question, at least in part, and declares to Pilate that he does does have a kingdom, but it's not a kingdom of this world. And what is he talking about? We know that Jesus is the word of God that has become flesh and lived among us. Jesus has come from God and has come so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. We also know that in order to recognize this king, this only son, we must be born from above. Unless we have experienced this new birth, we're unable to recognize the reign of God that surrounds us on all sides. And if we do accept that Jesus is the one who came from God, if we are willing to listen to the truth he speaks, then one is no longer a part of this world, but is a part of the reign of God. In the end, Pilate seems to mock Jesus and the Jews. As the Grinch mocked those in Whoville, Pilate is never able to understand that Jesus is a king unlike any other king of this world. Yet ultimately, Pilate unknowingly speaks the truth. He declares to the Jews, here is your king. And over the cross, Pilate places the announcement for all to see. Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Well, what does this mean? Well, this passage begins a long scene in which the gospel writer unfolds the reality of Jesus' kingship. It is a kingship that can be difficult to see, for it is manifest in crucifixion rather than in political dominance. Today, Jesus' kingship can be difficult to see as well. This radical idea that the power of a king is found not in the number of servants one has, but in being a servant to others, sounds absolutely ridiculous. The issue of Jesus' kingship is already raised in John chapter 6 as he satisfies the bellies of the 5,000 listening to him teach. They then try to seize him and force him to be king. But Jesus slips away. His authority as king originates not from this world but from God. And his kingdom has to do with the reign of love, not political expectancy aimed at personal gain of power. He knows that we tend to enslave ourselves to cynical rulers from whom power and coercion are synonyms, so long as they satisfy our bellies and require no sacrifice. Jesus also already knows that later in the story, the people of God will cry out with the most devastating irony, we have no king but Caesar. In verse 36, Jesus responds in a way to Pilate's king's question. But Jesus does not immediately answer the question about being a king. Rather, he immediately speaks out about himself, but his, and, but his community, it's his kingdom. Here he contrasts himself with Pilate. You see, Pilate uses power and authority for selfish ends with no concern for the building of community and certainly not a community guided by love and truth. Pilate hoards power and lords over people, even to the point of destroying them on a cross or otherwise. Jesus, on the other hand, empowers others and uses his authority to wash the feet of those he leads. He spends his life on them, every last ounce of it. He gives his life to bring life. Pilate rules brings terror even in the midst of calm. Jesus' rule brings peace even in the midst of terror. Pilate's followers imitate him by using violence to conquer and divide people by race, ethnicity, and nations. Jesus' followers put away their sword in order to invite and unify people as Jesus does what he says. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. Pilate's authority originates from the will of Caesar, 
and is always tenuous. Jesus' authority originates from doing the will of God and is eternal. In the end, Pilate attempts to crucify the truth. He places a placard nearby mockingly announcing Jesus as the king of the Jews. The irony is thick, of course, because Pilate has announced the truth. There on the cross, the king is crowned, not with diamonds or a laurel wreath, but with thorns. And from that lofty height, births the church. As the crucifixion makes clear, Jesus' kingship is not of this world. Worldly kings take power from others by winning battles or at least through stress, uh, successful diplomacy. Jesus neither fights nor allows his followers to do so. He does not mount a vigorous defense. Instead, Jesus offers an alternative to earthly kingship. I have been born and come into this world for this, to witness to the truth. Jesus' testimony to the truth appears embedded within the whole of John's gospel. In chapter 19, the manner of Jesus' death testifies to his true identity. Those who can hear or see the message of Jesus' crucifixion see Jesus as a king. And so what does that mean for us here today? Jesus, like Whoville, shows the world the truth. Christmas and kingship is not dependent on the things that the world values as important. Christmas was actually about a celebration with one another that no missing stocking or toy could ever take away. Kingship, Jesus shows, should actually be representative of the kingdom one built on love and trust and every person having value, rather than the domination that the world values. Pilate and so many others just don't get it. And neither did the Grinch, at least not at first. But the hope is that Jesus' story isn't over yet. And through his life, death, and resurrection, the world will learn the truth about Jesus as king. The truth is Jesus knows that we too, even now, tend to enslave ourselves to cynical rulers, from whom power and coercion are synonyms, so long as they satisfy our bellies and require no sacrifice. I think you heard me say that earlier. They don't have to even be people, as we are quick to let money, power, and our own personal desires rule us just as easily as any evil ruler would. Jesus also already knows that just like the Jews at Jesus' crucifixion, we too will cry out, we have no king but fill in your blank. But the good news is, we have a perfect king who does not desire to harm us or ignore us. Jesus empowers others and uses his authority to wash the feet of those he leads. We are called to do the same. Here in our church community, that looks like encouraging each other to participate in the ministries of the church and going out to serve those overlooked and undervalued by the world. Jesus spends his life on us, every ounce of it bringing life to us. Salvation is a gift freely given and that is good news that should be shared. Jesus' rule brings peace in the midst of terror. We also are called to bring peace and to build bridges between one another, not use differences as a reason to tear them down. Jesus' followers put away the sword in order to invite and unify people. And what does that look like? For us as a community to focus on valuing everyone, not only individually, but welcoming them in, knowing that each person is a blessing to our community. This goes against the boundaries and the ideas that society tries to draw between who belongs and who doesn't. In God's kingdom, everyone belongs. Jesus' authority originates from God's will and is eternal. Our call also becomes to do the will of God as we become empowered through the gift of the Holy Spirit. When we can do this and live into this type of kingdom, this kingdom that is different from everything we value in this world, but can only be found in a life with Jesus, we will be able to see the rightful king sitting on the throne and a new heaven and a new earth 
as a true and perfect kingdom. Loving truth wins over and over again. Long live the king. Amen and amen.